London's Park Lane. It is here, just behind the Hilton Hotel in fashionable Mayfair, that there lives a racing driver who from 1952 to his retirement in 1962 dominated his sport. His name, Sterling Moss. I drove a lot of cars in my career. I think 84 different types of motor car. Um, the reason I did that was I'm a racer. I enjoy driving. I mean, the reason I started racing because I love it. It's a super hobby. And the exhilaration I get from driving is, is enormous. The travel and meeting people and so on. And uh, if a person had a car, he said, look, would you drive my whatever it might be, a leather then G, because I knew he said, OK, sure, where is it? You know, give me the ignition key, I'll drive it. Uh, because to me, Cars are, they have their own character, they're all different, they're like women, and they all respond in different ways, but they all have, they, they answer, I think, to uh, technique. And you've got cars that understeer, cars that oversteer, cars that are easy, cars that are, that are difficult, but they all basically, you've got five wheels, a steering wheel and four other wheels, and, and the balance of a car and the message the car gives you is something that you as a driver have to interpret. And this to me was something that was very challenging and something that I enjoyed doing. Throughout his long career, Sterling kept a meticulous record of his life, both on and off the track. Of the 66 Grand Prix races he contested, he won 16 with 16 pole positions and 37 front row starts. A remarkable achievement. You were right. It was 12. I When it came to cars, um, I was very lucky because my first year, I entered, I think, in um, 12, I think it was 12 hill climbs and sprints and speed trials. And I think I got to about 10 firsts out of that, so eight or 10 firsts. So really, I had a, a fairly successful time. So then I went to my father and said, look, Dad, I've been offered a professional drive. Can I be a racing driver? And he said, um, all right, you've got two years to try, try and make it. Because my father had raced at Brooklands and, and I also did a race at Indianapolis and my mother had done uh, trials and hill climbs with quite a lot of success, I suppose I was brought up with cars. And uh, although the war came along was, was obviously quite a dampener because remember I was born in 29, so when the war came I was only uh, really quite young, but the, the age that you're, usually a guy's getting interested. Uh, and I did, I mean, I, I, started, I drove a car around the field at home to, with a chain harrow on the back and that sort of thing. And, uh, but having been brought up with cars, I think uh, it was fairly inevitable that I would want to go into it. Sterling never lost his passion for sports cars. Even after graduating to Formula One, he retained the manners of a gentleman. In all my life, in every race, and I've done 535 races before I retired, every single time I passed a driver, I either thanked them or shook my fist. Um, because it's not a moment that you take your hand off and say thank you, and if somebody's in the rally way, well, then you want to let him know. This isn't, isn't done today. I'm not going to say it could be done today, but even uh, in, the, in the middle era of the 70s, when it could be done, people didn't seem to do it. The, the, it's, it's just changed. Monaco, I remember going to Monaco, and you drive round, and there was a girl with pale pink lipstick at, at Oscar's bar, and every time I go past a blur, a kiss. You know, well, I, I, this doesn't sort of happen now. Sterling was married for the first time in 1957, and yet as a self-confessed womanizer, it was not long before this inveterate playboy was back on the London scene. I believe, I, I think I was the highest paid Formula One driver at, in, my, in my time. Uh, my top earning was 32,750 pounds gross in 1961. I paid tax after I'd managed to put through all my expenses, my manager, travel, hotels, costs and everything. I paid tax on 8,000, which was a very good wage. I mean, don't let's kid ourselves. 8,000 then was, you know, 100,000 now, I suppose, or maybe more. So, yes, I, I, it, it made me, it didn't make me rich, it made me well off. Success on the track led to a life off it that at times resembled that of a film star. However, he never lost the regard of his fellow drivers and in 1959 was awarded an OBE. Under the management of Tony Vandervel and later Rob Walker, he became Britain's most successful driver, but at a price, as this news film of an accident in 1960 clearly reveals. 
people say, you know, they've got death wish and all that. I've never heard so much baloney in my life. There's nothing I like more than life and living. And uh, if I ever thought, that, you know, that, that anything I did was going to cause me to die, I wouldn't start. I never, I never flirt with death in the way that I want to go too near and look over the edge. You know, I, or I, as long as I know that, I've, I, that I'm holding the balance in my own hands and that everything's going right, okay. But 1962, an accident at Goodwood had a profound effect on his career. When they finally cut him free, the full extent of his injuries was revealed. He remained unconscious for a month and was paralyzed down one side for a further six. At the time, few thought he would live. Sterling survived his terrible accident, but his racing career was effectively over. After an attempt to return, he decided in 1963 to finally quit. My crashes, and I've had quite a few, uh, didn't usually affect my desire to go near the edge because practically without exception, I reckon the crashes, I could, I could say why it was. I mean, I had seven wheels come off. I had eight brake failures, twice the steering shear that I was going. And when those happen, then I know it's not me. If I'd got into a corner, and made a mistake and not know why, then I would have been very worried. I would, I think I probably would have retired. Because you have to have, if you're going to race, you have to have enormous self-confidence. You have to be, when you see a friend of yours have an accident and get hurt, you have to be convinced that it wouldn't have happened if it had been you, because you wouldn't have done this or that or the other. Today, Sterling is back racing, but only for fun. Even when preparing for a celebrity race, he does so with characteristic thoroughness. I think that if, you're, if your life is one of competing with, uh, with life and death, if you like, in other words, in a, in a, in a very dodgy business, whatever it is, or, you know, mountain climbing or whatever, I think you need to be particular and meticulous about things. I've always thought maybe it was because I was a Virgo, because I have a lot of Virgo characteristics. But I do think, quite seriously, that if you are going to um, be risking your neck, obviously you want to cut, you want to take away all the, all the peripheral stuff that might not, might not be beneficial. And you cut it down, and usually having things neat and organized and knowing where you're going, what you're going to do, timing and everything else, is, is quite important. At the height of his career, Sterling Moss was second only to one man, the legendary Juan Fangio. Sterling joined Mercedes in 1955, but as etiquette required, he was never allowed to overtake his boss. It was only in sports cars that he was free to drive with characteristic panache. And it was here that he established his reputation as the best all-round driver, winning everything but the world championship title. It, it doesn't upset me a bit that I didn't win the world championship, because to win it when Fangio was going, I don't think it would have been right anyway. When Fangio retired, I got to the age, age I suppose, when, when you know, when I, I wasn't too worried about it. I mean, I, I was really upset the first time I lost it to Mike Hawthorne because I really thought that I, was, I could beat him. I got more points in the, in the Gold Star and all that sort of thing. And I thought I could beat him. But he won the title because of he had more places than whatever it was. I can't remember the exact things. Now, I lost it once by half a point, once by a whole point, once because I gave evidence on behalf of Mike saying he hadn't pushed the wrong way of the circuit and so on, which cost me the title. But, but those two times, then I thought, well, what does it matter? What really matters is, do I have the respect of my fellow drivers? Do I enjoy what I'm doing? And am I going to do it as well as I can? The reason I race now is for fun. I get exhilaration. And I was lucky enough to win a race in America the other day, driving into a birdcage, which I used to race. And that gave me enormous pleasure. If I'd been beaten, I would have been really, really upset. I'm sure I would, of course I would. But it did give me enormous pleasure, and, and the people I'm with are so nice. Yeah, I know, but then I took the wouldn't go into third. Keep agreed. Three skews, get the help and drive. We're now trying, boy. I don't know how I'm com how I'm particularly am complex. I am, I suppose. I guess the person you really need to ask is my wife. I, um, I mean, I've, I've now had three wives. Uh, the other two couldn't stand the heat in the kitchen, they got out. <laughs> uh, but the current one, I hope to goodness, will stay, and, and uh, she can accept my shortcomings. I'm, I'm selfish, I think. It's very difficult to have a life where people are continually asking you about you. When I was 17, 18, uh, 
newspaper would come out, what do you think, what do you feel? They ring up and say, what do you think about this, what do you think about that, that they've changed the law or something, what do you think, and, which is ridiculous, but nevertheless, because what the hell do I know about it? But when this is happening all the time, and you're being made the centre of attention, and you're being, gosh, you did a great race, it's very difficult not to be spoiled. I am thoughtless, I wish I wasn't thoughtless, but I don't think enough. Um, I try to be considerate, and if, if something's pointed out to me, I will be, but, but as a person, I don't think I'm as considerate as, as, as certainly as I'd like to be. Um, I have a lot of traits like that which are uh, a part were necessary in my, in my business. You see, the fact that I could make a decision instantly, I had to, because that, that's going to save my life. Today, Sterling is a London property dealer. He still tinkers with machines and has, over the years, filled his Mayfair house with a maze of electronic gadgets, including a bath that can be operated remotely and a neat way to serve supper. You ready? Come on, you get... What? You just made that up, I must say. <laughs> well, I had to jump over the door. She was on oh, the oh, bottom oh, steps. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, just, just a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I do like this. Wouldn't it have been fighting with Jack and all those? No, all, quite the, that no. whole gag of I the think <laughs> when I kick the bucket, and one obviously has to, it, it'd be nice to be remembered as a person who really enjoyed the sport in which I took oh, part. Yeah, further. I would also like to be remembered for trying to get other people to enjoy what I enjoy, in other words, trying to explain what is good about motor racing, why it is such a, a fabulous sport. But uh, if people will realise that I really did enjoy it, that would be nice. That'd be nice. Mm -hmm.